Through most of the 19th and 20th centuries, steam-driven ocean liners paraded back and forth between the old world and the new as if the North Atlantic were a grand promenade. These floating cities cater to every whim of the wealthy elite while ferrying millions of immigrants to a new life in America. With stately names like Deutschland, Mauritania, Titanic, and Normandy, they were the pride of nations, grand exhibitions of cutting edge technology and high style. As with the clipper ships of an earlier era, speed was the foremost objective of these majestic leviathons. They raced each other across the Atlantic, competing for the coveted Blue Ribbon, the ultimate prize for the fastest liner on the seas. But luxury came to be an equally important goal, and the pursuit of these sometimes conflicting aims spurred the design of the largest, most graceful passenger ships ever created. One liner that combined these qualities as few others had before was the Queen Mary. With an overall length of 1,019 feet and a gross weight of more than 80,000 tons, she could carry 3,000 passengers and crew in unparalleled comfort. Yet despite her awesome size, she was capable of traveling at speeds of over 30 knots, faster than all but the swiftest warships. In many ways, the quintessential liner, the Queen Mary and the others of her kind came to symbolize an age, an age when size, speed, and luxury came together to produce the ultimate steamships of all time. In their time, the great liners were by far the largest, most complex moving objects ever constructed. From their powerful steam engines to their opulent interiors, they incorporated all the latest advances in naval architecture. Launched in 1968, the 65,000 ton Queen Elizabeth II embodies this tradition as no other ship in the world. Like her forebears, she was designed primarily for a single purpose, to carry passengers in comfort and safety along a route that was, and still is, one of the most treacherous on the high seas, the North Atlantic. We float in a, in a hostile environment, the sea, and that hasn't changed since Columbus sailed across, and it still can surprise us and uh, take us aback occasionally. Last year, this ship had the misfortune to encounter a 90-foot wave, which landed on the forecastle. Lo and behold, this thing came out of the out of the darkness and landed on the ship, which, bless our heart, shook herself as a thoroughbred does, and went on her way. This is one of the wonderful things about this ship. She was actually designed for the North Atlantic, and she's immensely strong. Yet despite the level of strength and sophistication they eventually achieved, the modern ocean liner had humble origins. In the early 1800s, sail-driven wooden ships called packets were the mainstays of the transatlantic trade. With voyages that could last anywhere from two to six weeks, a passage on one of these vessels could be as unpleasant as an Atlantic storm. It was not a comfortable experience. The steerage was cramped, you couldn't stand upright, the food was terrible, the weather on the Atlantic was unpredictable, uh, many, many, many people were sick. Uh, I think the universal conclusion for most of the people that uh, have any remembrance of it, even to this day, is that under those conditions, uh, the sooner it was over, the better. Among those who felt that travel by packet could be vastly improved upon was a native Nova Scotian named Samuel Cunard. Cunard owned a 40-vessel fleet of packet ships that carried mail between Halifax, Newfoundland, and Bermuda. But after making a large profit on a steam-powered vessel that successfully crossed the Atlantic in 1833, Cunard became convinced that the future of transatlantic trade belonged to steam. In 1839, the British Admiralty advertised for a contractor to carry mail on a monthly schedule across the Atlantic by steamship. Cunard immediately sailed to London to convince the Admiralty that he was the man for the job. Well, Samuel Cunard was like many other individuals who emerged at this time. He was fundamentally an entrepreneur. 
Uh, he did that successfully. He won the contract. He was able to move forward and to construct his ships. Kennard's fleet of four new steamships was designed by a nautical engineer in Glasgow named Robert Napier. London snobs made fun of Napier, considering the son of a blacksmith to be nothing more than a country tinkerer. But Cunard believed that Napier's combination of imagination and hard-headed practicality could produce the kind of ships he needed to conquer the North Atlantic. The formal name for Cunard's new mail line was the British and North American Royal Mail Steam Packet Company. But from day one, it was known simply as the Cunard Line. The Admiralty granted Cunard a seven-year contract to provide weekly service from Liverpool to Halifax and Boston for the then considerable sum of 55,000 pounds per year overall. The contract also specified that in the advent of war, Cunard would turn the ships over to the Admiralty for the use of the Royal Navy. Mail, I think, was the main mover of that day. I mean, we are still titled RMS on this ship. Royal Mail ship, although we don't carry any mail nowadays, it goes by aircraft. And Sam Cunard climbed on the man wagon with mail very quickly. The first Napier designed Cunard ship, the 1,154 ton Britannia, set out on her first Atlantic crossing on July 4, 1840. Like her three later sister ships, Britannia had a length of 207 feet and a beam of 34. Her top speed was nine knots, and she could transport 115 passengers and 225 tons of cargo. And like steamers for many years to come, she was also equipped with sails for auxiliary power. After a rousing send-off in Liverpool, 65 passengers, including Samuel Cunard himself, made the maiden voyage to Halifax. The crossing took 12 days, 10 hours. Then it was on to Boston and a hero's welcome. The citizens of Boston, in order to continue to enjoy the privileges of being the premier port in the United States, went out of their way to make Samuel Cunard feel welcome. Uh, there's a story reported on one occasion in the, the winter when the uh, Britannia became locked in ice in Boston Harbor and that the citizens went out themselves and helped break up the ice to make sure that the ship would sail. The inaugural voyage of Cunard's Britannia proved the feasibility of steam packet lines and ushered in a new era in shipping. Sensing that they could make huge profits, several British and American entrepreneurs formed rival steamship companies, spawning a high-stakes competition for the transatlantic trade. There was a lot of money to be made. The various companies were in competition with each other. One of the biggest competitions was with speed. <laughs> Speed had always been important to the shipping industry, but during the age of steam, it became an obsession. The competing steamship lines raced one another across the Atlantic. The liner with the fastest crossing time was awarded the coveted Blue Ribbon. It was a wonderful marketing idea. It actually was created, I believe, by the companies themselves as a kind of private competition that would drive, would drive sales. Um, and in fact, uh, it, it, of course, it, it claimed a kind of mythological prestige. And whoever had it trumpeted that in their advertising. That was the thing, in fact, that separated them from the rest of the pack, speed. Yet from the beginning, the race for speed was more than just a matter of selling tickets. The Victorian era was a very strange era in lots of ways. There were a lot of buccaneers around with top hats on who had tremendous egos. There was a lot of national pride in having the fastest ship in the Atlantic. Throughout the 1840s, Cunard steamships dominated the race for speed. The Blue Ribbon merely passed from one Cunard ship to another, and the Atlantic came to be known as Cunard's Pond. But to the inherently conservative Cunard, safety was even more important than speed. He was very insistent on that. His instructions to his masters when he first started to own and run ships was safety first. On the other hand, 
The comfort of his passengers seemed to be near the bottom of Cunard's list of priorities. The accommodations were tight and cramped. You didn't have a lot of space to carry fresh fruits and vegetables, so a lot of foods that came aboard had to be prepared in such a way as it would not spoil. Salted meat and canned vegetables made for a trip that could be as dreary for a passenger's palate as the weather on the North Atlantic. But since all the other steamship lines had an equally conservative approach to their passengers' comfort, the Spartan accommodations on Cunard's ships failed to retard the rapid growth of his business. But by the mid-1800s, two rivals appeared on the scene who would challenge Cunard's dominance by completely revolutionizing the concept of ocean liner design. One was a flamboyant American named Edward Knight Collins, who introduced the idea of luxury to the construction of ocean liners. Another was Isambard Kingdom Brunel, an eccentric English engineer who set the stage for the giant liners of the future by building a ship that became a legend. The American shipping magnate Edward Knight Collins was so fond of the theater, he named his fleet of sailing packets the Dramatic Line and his flagship, the Shakespeare. In 1850, Collins made a flamboyant entrance into the Atlantic steamliner trade with a fleet of four new ships. Each one was a third larger and two knots faster than Cunard's best. One of the reasons Collins' liners were faster was that he insisted his captains run their ships at nearly full power for the entire voyage across the Atlantic, even during dangerous conditions. Yet despite their speed, the major selling point of a Collins liner was luxury. Collins had seized on the idea that the transatlantic traveler wanted both a fast and a comfortable journey and would pay a handsome price for the privilege. Edward Knight Collins made sure that the interiors were plusher, much more comfortable, and many more facilities uh, for diversion, exercise, and so on. Collins' ships had barber shops, lush drawing rooms, gilded ceilings, and stained glass windows. And the food was comparable to that of the finest restaurants. Life aboard a Cunard liner of the period was an entirely different story. Well, they didn't have much more than they had on the packets. The, the early ships were not well appointed by any means. Charles Dickens made a passage on one of those ships, and I think he described the conditions as comparable to his coffin. Passengers wanted something more, and Edward Knight Collins was smart in realizing that amenities would also sell tickets. And sell tickets they did. By the mid-1850s, Collins was carrying 50% more passenger traffic than Cunard. Watching this disturbing trend from his opulent new headquarters in Liverpool, England, Cunard decided to go on the offensive. He began to upgrade his fleet and his service. The result? A new Napier-designed, iron-hulled, 3,300-ton paddle steamer named the Persia. Well, the Persia is an example of, of, of the kind of change that evolved in this period. She was three times larger than her predecessors, much, much greater sense of luxury. Clearly, there was a, an attempt now to deal with the comfort of the accommodation of the passenger. I believe the Persia had something like 800 staterooms, and they all had private baths. The Persia also pushed Cunard ahead in the race for speed. Her 40-foot paddle wheels and powerful steam engines drove her across the Atlantic at a record-breaking average speed of 14 knots, allowing her to easily capture the blue ribbon. In an effort to regain the prestigious ribbon, the U.S. Congress promptly increased Collins' annual subsidy from $385,000 to $858,000 a year so he could build bigger, faster steamships. Then, on September 27, 1854, the Collins Line's insistence on speed at any cost finally caught up with them. As their liner Arctic steamed at full speed through heavy fog off the Grand Banks near southeastern Newfoundland, she collided with a French steamer. While the iron-hulled French steamer was only slightly damaged, the wooden-hulled Arctic sank quickly, taking 322 of her passengers and crew to the bottom. 
if you think about it, they were very foolish and very brave to try and speed through fog at 21 knots when you couldn't see the forecastle head. They had tremendous faith in their dead reckoning navigation, and there were corners cut. Among the dead in the Arctic disaster were Edward Collins' wife and two children. It was the beginning of a streak of ill fortune for the Collins line. After more years of catastrophes at sea and annual losses that ran into the millions, the Collins line sank beneath a sea of red ink in 1858. Like a shooting star, the rise and fall of the Collins line was brief but brilliant. With his daring and imagination, Edward Collins pushed the race for speed to new heights. But most importantly, he forever changed the way Atlantic liners were judged by the public, adding the quest for luxury into the competitive equation of ocean liner design. Blending luxury and speed in a single ship could be a difficult balancing act. Luxurious appointments and large engines each took up space and added to the weight or displacement of the vessel. One solution was to simply make the liners big enough to hold both large engines and luxury features. But this increased the expense of constructing and maintaining the ships, making the design of ocean liners a matter of complex trade-offs for the designer. The bigger, more powerful steam engines developed in the mid-1800s also posed challenges. They put greater stress on wooden hulls, which in turn led to the construction of iron and later steel hulled ships. These vessels could be made large enough to accommodate not only greater luxury, but also an area that would become increasingly important in the years ahead, steerage. Since the days of sail, European immigrants of modest means had traveled to America in steerage, or third-class accommodations on the lower decks. In 1852, after inaugurating its new service to New York City, the Cunard Line became one of the first steamship companies to make room in its liners for steerage passengers. His accommodations were crude compared to first class, but the steam liners were still faster, safer, and more comfortable than the sailing packets had ever been. Wave after wave of immigrants had already crossed the piers of South Street, uh, the, the street of ships in Lower Manhattan, uh, into the uh, mid-19th century. The steamship operators uh, responded to that. The technology enabled them to, to build the faster and, and larger ships, and it became very viable business. It was far more profitable than the early contracts for mail and cargo. Even as people came to expect larger, faster, and more luxurious ocean liners, a London engineer named Isambard Kingdom Brunel surpassed everyone's expectations with a gigantic new liner launched the very same year the Collins Line went bankrupt. His ship, the Great Eastern, was fully five times larger than anything else afloat. Brunel, like Napier, was a brilliant engineer. He built bridges and uh, industrial facilities. He was one of those great figures of the Industrial Revolution, and his impact was felt not only in the, in the marine trades, but throughout the history of engineering. Brunel's Great Eastern was 690 feet long, and weighed nearly 19,000 tons. Driven by two huge steam engines that turned both a 24-foot screw propeller and side paddle wheels, she could make an astonishing 18 knots, a full four knots faster than Cunard's blue ribbon holder, the Persia. The largest of her five salons encompassed 3,000 square feet, and some of her 800 staterooms even had their own bathtubs. Besides the need to provide for both large engines and luxurious amenities, the Great Eastern's huge size was meant to accommodate enough coal so she could make the long haul to Australia without stopping to refuel. But instead, she was put into service on the more glamorous Atlantic run, where, expensive and unwieldy, she quickly proved to be a wallowing white elephant. Brunel himself died of a fatal stroke in 1859, before his creation made her first voyage. The Great Eastern was designed to carry some 4,000 plus passengers. But beset by marketing and technical problems, she never carried more than a fraction of her capacity. After bankrupting several sets of new owners, the liner was finally employed in the laying of the transatlantic telegraph cable, linking the old world with the new. Ironically, 
the 2,000-mile-long spool of cable fit comfortably in the liner's massive grand salon. This dangerous and momentous undertaking was successfully completed in 1866. It proved to be the Great Eastern's one and only moment of glory. In her final years, she ended up in London as a floating carnival and sideshow and became somewhat of a joke and an embarrassment until finally the ship was sold and scrapped altogether. Yet despite the Great Eastern's ill-fated career, Isambard Brunel's dream of ever faster, larger, and more luxurious ocean liners became contagious. In the fever of the moment, people began to believe these marvelous creations were so advanced that they were unsinkable. Within a generation, they would be proved disastrously wrong. April 10th, 1912. The SS Titanic, pride of the British White Star Line, set out on her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York. At the time, she was the largest, most luxurious ship afloat. She was also a symbol of just how much had changed in the decades since the launch of the Great Eastern. Long gone were the days when people referred to the Atlantic as Cunard's Pond. Samuel Cunard had died in 1865. His line survived and prospered, but it faced increased competition from newly formed steamship lines in England, Germany, France, and the United States. The Titanic was only the latest in a long line of challenges to Cunard's share of the Atlantic trade. Because of her size and her extravagant appointments, the Titanic was called a floating palace. Ironically, she was also designed in a conscious attempt to appeal to the immigrants who would travel in far plainer style below decks. The immigrants who came to uh, America equated safety with the size of the vessel and also with the number of stacks. So you saw the big four stack mammoth liners built in Germany and in Great Britain. It's very little known that in fact on the Titanic, the uh, fourth stack was placed there just as a ventilation stack, but the builders were afraid to launch it with three stacks because it wouldn't be competitive in the immigrant trade. By this time, the race for speed had become a contest between Cunard and the Germans. Out of uh, the whole history of this period, uh, it goes back and forth between speed and accommodation. What vessel would get you there faster? What vessel had the most glorious accommodations? They were two marketing strategies. Sometimes the companies tried to do them simultaneously, and it changed very, very quickly because the records were being broken very quickly. However, with the launch of the Titanic and her sister ship, the Olympic, White Star was gambling on the idea that their liners didn't have to be the fastest, that by building enormous ships that catered to every whim of first-class travelers, while also fulfilling the basic needs of passengers and steerage, they could win the lion's share of the transatlantic trade. The Titanic was a full 50% larger than Cunard's biggest liner. With a length of 852 feet, and a displacement of over 46,000 tons. There was room for over 300 passengers in first class and more than 500 in steerage. The difference between first class and third, however, was enormous. When you were in third class, it might have been better than it was before. You had standing headroom, the food was probably better, you may have had more privacy to the accommodations, uh, but you were still um, in the bottom of the boat. You were still uh, down in the bilges. The Titanic was divided into 16 watertight compartments, which could be sealed on a moment's notice by tripping a switch on the bridge. This system was thought to make the ship practically unsinkable. On the fourth day of her maiden voyage, the Titanic was traveling through an area of the North Atlantic that was dotted with icebergs. But with supreme confidence in the advanced construction of his ship, Captain Edmund J. Smith made the risky decision of maintaining the Titanic speed of over 22 knots instead of slowing down until clear of the ice field. At a little before midnight on April 14, 1912, disaster struck when the Titanic collided with an iceberg off the coast of Newfoundland. 
In less than three hours, the ship plunged to the bottom of the icy sea. Of a total of 2,208 passengers and crew, more than 1,500 were lost. Captain Smith, wasn't it? Um, captain of the Titanic. Maiden voyage, the unsinkable ship. He, he was confident that his decision to take a risk was the right one to do. And of course, he went down with his ship and nobody will ever find out what his actual last thoughts were. Cutting corners again. Can't do it now. Uh, if you're caught, not only do you lose your job, you can go to jail, you can be punished in court of law. You just can't take risks. The sinking of the Titanic came as a crushing blow to the White Star Line. Since its founding in 1870, the company's history had been one of milestones in the development of the superliner, with major advances in steam propulsion, hull design, and passenger accommodations. For a time, the White Star Line were completely successful, and uh, they really offered some stiff competition against Cunard. However, later in their career, uh, they did have some difficulty maintaining the stiff edge with competition because the speed of the Cunard ships were still enough to draw away uh, many passengers who wanted to get acro across as quickly as possible. By the early 1900s, White Star had decided to concede the race for speed and to concentrate instead on building the most luxurious ships afloat. The Titanic and Olympic had been the supreme expressions of that goal. Yet despite the Titanic's tragic end, the White Star Line would survive to play an important role in the future of the transatlantic trade. It was a future in which German steamship lines like Hamburg America would play an increasingly large part. And more than any other nation, the Germans used the immigrant trade to surge ahead in the race to dominate the North Atlantic. In 1910, the going rate for a luxury suite on an ocean liner was a princely $4,000. The same trip for a passenger in steerage cost as little as 50. But even at these rates, more than half of a steamship's line's profits came from steerage. During 1907 alone, over a million immigrants booked passage to America on ocean liners. Because the largest numbers came from Central Europe, the German lines reaped a bonanza from the immigrant trade. Well, the Germans emerged as a powerful force in this era. Clearly, there was a tremendous immigration uh, movement from the port of Bremerhaven to, to the United States. They were remarkable engineers and shipbuilders, and so they were not behind by any means in building vessels that moved quickly through the water and were well accommodated. Hamburg America liners, like the Imperator, the first ship larger than the Titanic, were designed to take full advantage of the mass migration from Europe. The gigantic superliner had a total capacity of over 5,000, 3,000 of whom rode in steerage. But Hamburg America's director, Albert Ballin, went to great lengths to court the high end of the trade as well. He hired Charles Mevis, the protege of Cesar Ritz, the famous hotelier, to design the interior to make them the most luxurious that had ever been on the North Atlantic. Cesar Ritz himself was invited to design and operate an a la carte grill on the upper deck at the stern of the ship. And very often after dinner, the passengers would be able to dance in the Palm Garden area with a live orchestra. By the early 1900s, the German lines were carrying well over 50% of the passenger traffic on the Atlantic, with ships that were larger, more luxurious, and faster than the competition. The Cunard line, on the other hand, in direct competition, began to design new ships which would take back the coveted blue ribbon. And in the early 1900s, they began to design what would become the Mauritania and Lusitania. The British Admiralty provided Cunard's chief designer, Leonard Peskett, with a list of specifications as to the length, beam, displacement, and speed of the new ships. But there were other requirements as well. Requirements that were supported by government subsidies, just like those that facilitated the transportation of mail. 
there were subsidies to commercial ships for carrying mail, but of course one of the big subsidies was so they could, could be converted into our merchant cruisers and carrying troops. The, the Mauritania class were fitted to carry guns. Uh, they had strengthened decks and the, they could be converted very rapidly into our merchant cruisers. Since the new superliners were to be the pride of Great Britain, Peskett also saw to it that luxury and comfort were an integral part of the ship's design. The sister ships Lusitania and Mauritania were launched in 1907. Their narrow beam to length ratio, 760 feet by 88, gave them the sleek classic lines of a thoroughbred. Their engines generated an astonishing 68,000 horsepower by harnessing a relatively new invention called the Parsons turbine, in which pressurized steam passed through a series of bladed rotors to drive a shaft. The Lusitania and Mauritania were the first large steamships to take advantage of the technology. Because the interesting thing is that turbines, which gave great speed, were grabbed by the commercial interest, and everybody put turbines into their packet ships, whereas the navies of the world were very slow, so you had a situation whereby the passenger ships were faster than the battleships. During her trial runs, the Mauritania made 26 knots, then crossed the Atlantic in the record time of just over four and a half days to capture the Blue Ribbon. It was an impressive start of what would become a spectacular, lengthy career. The Mauritania would hold the speed record for an unprecedented 22 years. Her sister ship, the Lusitania, would not be so lucky. On May 7, 1915, the Lusitania was steaming 12 miles off the Irish coast. With the outbreak of World War I less than a year before, the Atlantic was no longer the setting for a tense but friendly rivalry between German and British ships. The two nations were now locked in a battle for national survival. Since the beginning of the war, German submarines had wreaked havoc on British merchant shipping. Now, the Lusitania was, of course, a very luxurious ship, and it was very fast and attracted many faithful Cunard travelers uh, throughout her existence. And many passengers agreed with the Cunard Steamship Company in believing that the Lusitania was m too fast for a U-boat to catch her. But by an incredible coincidence, a German U-boat happened to be checking its bearings just as the Lusitania passed by. Spotting the huge liner steaming right into his sights, the U-boat commander gave the order to fire. The ship sank in a mere 18 minutes. Of the total 1,595 passengers and crew, 1,200 died, including 128 Americans. The sinking of the Lusitania was denounced by people the world over and was a key event in provoking America to declare war on Germany. I don't think it affected the British people anything like as much as it affected the Americans. I mean, they've just celebrated the Battle of the Somme, and there were 76,000 British soldiers killed in one day. So I think the Lusitania loss may have caused indignation, but the actual numbers of people who were actually killed was just paled into insignificance. I think from the United States point of view, it was totally the other way, and there was tremendous outrage. Soon after the sinking of the Lusitania, 38 of Germany's great liners, which had been brought to neutral America for safekeeping, were immediately confiscated by the U.S. government. Renamed, refitted, and camouflaged, they served the United States as troop ships for the remainder of the war, alongside the American and British liners that had once been their peacetime rivals. These vessels always had had a kind of hidden secondary purpose. That proved to be true in the First World War, the Second World War, indeed in the most recent conflict in the Falkland Islands, when the QE2 was turned into a troop passenger ship and moved enormous numbers of British troops from England to the coast of South America. A generation after the sinking of the Lusitania, great liners that had been launched during peacetime would again be transformed carrying millions of soldiers across oceans that had once more become scenes of terror and infamy. With their massive size and speed, 
these great ships steamed to the rescue in their nation's darkest hours. In the late 1930s, the Cunard Line approached its 100th anniversary in a world of uncertainty, a world still reeling from the Great Depression and inching closer to war every day. The Blue Ribbon was being traded back and forth between Germany's Europa and Bremen, Italy's Rex, and France's Normandy. These brash, modern superliners not only offered unparalleled luxury for first-class travelers, but something new, tourist class. An upgraded steerage class with improvements in food, entertainment, and recreational facilities. It was a strategy designed to make up for the huge revenues lost after the United States imposed strict new immigration quotas in 1924. During the depths of the Depression, Another key development was the merger of Cunard and its financially troubled rival, White Star, as a provision of a new subsidy agreement with the British Admiralty. One thing, however, had not changed over the years. The christening and launch of a new Cunard ship still drew great crowds of cheering Britons to the John Brown shipyards on the River Clyde, especially when the Queen herself was presiding over the ceremony. The Queen's presence was particularly appropriate since the ship was named after her, the Queen Mary. The gigantic ship was more than just a new luxury liner. She was a symbol of pride for the British people. With a length of 1,019 feet and weighing 81,000 tons, the Queen Mary was the largest ship in the world. And with a top speed of over 30 knots, the fastest. She won the Blue Ribbon with ease, crossing the Atlantic in three days, 20 hours, and 42 minutes. The Queen Mary was driven by four giant steam turbines, each of which could generate 40,000 horsepower. Though the machinery required to support and control these massive power plants was extremely complex, it was also efficient and highly dependable. Masterpieces of cutting-edge technology the Queen Mary's engines helped make her one of the fastest ocean liners ever built. Far above the noise and vibration of the Queen Mary's engine room was an entirely different world, one of unparalleled style and comfort. To the enduring scorn of many art critics, the ship's Art Deco interiors marked a distinct departure from the period look of previous Cunard ships. But the passengers rarely complained. The passengers just got away everything they ever wanted. We used to walk the dogs for them up on the promenade deck and up on the sun deck. They had a gardener on the ship who was, uh, and had his own florist shop, and we used to come up and deliver corsages to the uh, ladies before they went to dinner. The completion of the Queen Mary's sister ship, the Queen Elizabeth, would bring to fruition a long-held goal of the Cunard Line. With the speed and size of these vessels, Cunard could maintain a weekly express service with only two ships, each being markedly more cost efficient than their aging predecessors. That goal was thwarted in the fall of 1939, when Nazi Germany's Blitzkrieg in Poland plunged Europe into World War II. The Queen Mary and her still uncompleted sister ship were stripped of their luxury accommodations, painted gray, and put to work as troop carriers. Extraordinary, we have 15,000 men in a ship. Thank God there wasn't a, a torpedo or a mine around. It would have been one of the biggest disasters of the war. And they had a hard war because they were run fast and hard all the time. Um, probably was instrumental in the at the end of their life, they were becoming very uneconomical because they really were worn out. By the end of the war, the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth had ferried nearly two million Allied soldiers into battle. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill estimated that the Queens had shortened the length of the war by at least a year. Before returning to civilian life, 
the Queen Mary was given one last mission, crossing the Atlantic over a dozen times to reunite American servicemen with the brides they had married overseas. Oh my, oh my word, <laughs> it was thrilling, thrilling. It was so huge, so beautiful, so majestic. I, I was frightened to go on her. I've never seen anything so, so beautiful in my life. And they had the beauty parlor on board. They had Piccadilly Circus with lots and lots of candy, or, or you know, chocolate bars and Hershey's especially. Following the last of these crossings, both queens were completely refurbished to once again serve as luxury liners. Gunnard's goal of a two-ship Atlantic Express service at last became a reality. After over a century of operation, Cunard had seemingly achieved the perfect combination of size, speed, and luxury to dominate the transatlantic passenger trade for years to come. But then another miracle of modern technology arrived on the scene that would decisively alter the complex equation of transatlantic travel, the jet plane. By the early 1960s, the idea of crossing the Atlantic in five days or less seemed hopelessly outdated when airliners made the same trip in a few hours. And with their designs specifically tailored for conditions on the North Atlantic, the great liners were difficult to adapt for other uses. But they were a bit like dinosaurs, you know, 1,400 crew, a three-class ship, very deep draft, so they had to stay in the North Atlantic, couldn't cruise them. To begin with, they weren't air conditioned, and you can't go into the West, in West Indies in a non air conditioned ship. We tried in Canaan, <laughs> and they burnt a ton of fuel to get backwards and forwards. In late September 1967, the 31 year old Queen Mary cast off in New York for her final Atlantic crossing. On the morning of September 25th, the two queens approached each other in mid ocean. As the mighty superliners raced past each other, their horns thundered a simultaneous salute. It was the farewell to an era. It was an era, I suppose, which probably ran on a little bit too late. But the um, 707 fixed that anyway. And um, the only thing about it, we f go across the North Atlantic and I can hear Concord going over and it thumps with its sound barrier. The only thing I always say is that to read our menu, you could probably fly from London to New York before you finished it. The Queen Mary's last voyage was around Cape Horn to Long Beach, California, where she was permanently moored to serve as a floating museum, hotel, and civic center. On her arrival at her new home, she was treated to a warm welcome by thousands of new fans and a number of old ones. I come here as, as much as I can. I drag people over here, you know, just come for breakfast or come for supper, or just go walk about, you know, things like that. It, uh, she's part of my life now, very much part of my life. I feel very tender towards her. The Queen Mary remains today the symbol of a time when she and her forebears ruled the seas as no other steamships had done before. They helped to build a nation, and they made the act of crossing the ocean into a romantic adventure. It is a legacy that still resonates to this very day.
and the documentaries continue next, here on Forces TV.